Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2013 Duke Economics Graduation Ceremony. It's exciting to be able to share this wonderful day with all of you. One of the great privileges in my life is that I get to serve on the faculty here at Duke with my wife, Tracy, who's just sitting down. And so I wanted to start today's ceremony by wishing her and all of the mothers here today and watching at home a happy Mother's Day. For many years now, the commencement ceremonies here at Duke have been held on Mother's Day, or typically on Mother's Day. And I used to think that was kind of inconvenient, you know, graduation kind of crowding out um, Mother's Day, if you will. But as my own kids get older, I've gained a greater appreciation uh, for just how meaningful and joyful occasions such as these are, not just for our graduates, but for, for their whole families. I know that many of you have traveled here today, but also have sacrificed a lot over the years to make this day possible. And so I actually think it's fantastic that we're able to celebrate both graduation and commencement and, and Mother's Day on the same day. We as faculty here at Duke join with you today in celebrating the amazing accomplishments of your, of your daughters and sons, grandsons and granddaughters here in our department. As faculty, we have the chance to meet and to work with some of the brightest, most creative, and most intellectually engaged students from every part of this country and from many countries around the world. This class in particular is a tremendous graduating class at all levels, bachelor's, master's, and doctorate. We've had a, re a near record number of our undergraduates write honors theses and receive honors this year, many of which you can see displayed behind the stage here. And the number of students graduating with distinction in the class of 2013 uh, is among the highest we've ever had as a department. We've also had a record number of our students from both the undergraduate and master's program going on to pursue PhDs in economics and other related fields. And we have an exceptional cohort of doctoral students here. In what remains a very difficult job market, all of these folks have found excellent research, teaching, research and teaching positions in universities, central banks, and private firms around the world. We as a faculty are both very proud of their accomplishments as students here at Duke and are certain that there's many great things to come. We welcome all of you uh, to a new group, our distinguished alumni of our department, and we look forward to keeping in touch with you and, and following you, uh, your, your endeavors in years to come. So I'd like to start today's ceremony by introducing our honorary faculty speaker. Each year our department honors a faculty member who has made extraordinary contributions to teaching and mentoring by selecting him or her to speak at our graduation ceremony. This year, it's my great pleasure, great honor, to introduce Connell Fullenkamp to you as our 2013 faculty honoree. <laughs> Connell received his PhD from Harvard in 1992 and came to Duke in 1999 after serving on the faculty at Notre Dame for seven years. Simply put, Connell is one of the outstanding undergraduate teachers here at Duke. Over the years, he has not only taught a number of our upper level uh, courses on financial markets, many of which are perennially oversubscribed by our students, and there's, there's kind of a long lines to get into, but he, he's also taught our principles course, the course that introduces our students to the subject of economics. And in this role, Connell has introduced uh, a countless number of Duke students, including I'm sure many of you, uh, to the subject of economics, drawing them in to a new way of viewing the world and equipping them with a powerful set of tools for analyzing a wide range of social and economic problems that, that will be very, uh, very useful in the years to come. As I'm sure your sons and daughters can tell you, Connell is both a very demanding and an extremely engaging teacher. He challenges his students not only to master the course material, but to develop a foundation, an aptitude, and even a joy for thinking, of them, thinking for themselves and for doing so in an intellectually rigorous way. To give you just a bit of sense of how our students view Connell's courses, I, I took a couple of quotes from a recent teaching evaluation, which I've, now, which I've now put in the wrong order, sorry. Here we go. So one, one quote is, this course is a lot of work, but completely useful. Never have I looked forward to going to class as much as I do this class. Another one is, one of the hardest classes I've ever taken, but it was one of the best. I think I'll actually use this after college. That last line is one of those kind of backhanded compliments that we on the faculty always love to hear. <laughs> Despite the demands of his course, Connell has twice received college-wide teaching awards, 
Most, most recently, he won a university-wide teaching award here at Duke from the Duke Alumni Association. And this is a special award here at Duke because it's the only student-nominated teaching award. And so it really means that despite this kind of demanding and engaging coursework, uh, Connell has really reached his, his students in a way that very few of us do. I could go on and on. And in addition to his many teaching roles, Connell has served our department, the university, and, the, and society as a whole in an enormous number of capacities. His door is always open, and literally almost every time I walk by, he's talking with students. Whether those are students from his course, uh, he's, he advises a, a tremendous number of independent studies, I think probably the most on our faculty over the last decade. He provides a lot of general advice about our courses and curriculum as the director of undergraduate studies for our department, and really just kind of a broad set of practical uh, life and career advice to a, such a wide range of students, it's, it's hard to count. Uh, he engages with our students and with the university in a way that, that very few on our faculty are able to do, and in a way that really uh, reflects tremendously on our department. In addition to his work teaching here at Duke, Connell also serves in a, as an advisor for the International Monetary Fund, and his research influences policy the worldwide. He was recognized this year uh, by the International Center for Financial Regulation for a, for a Financial Times Research Prize, which is a very distinguished prize. Uh, his courses are featured in the Great Courses series, and, and really I could go on and on, but it comes down to this. Over the past decade, few professors at Duke have had as great an impact on as many students as Connell Follenkamp. It's simply an honor uh, to be his colleague and my great pleasure to introduce him today uh, as our honorary faculty speaker for 2013. Well, I must say, uh, I am extremely humbled by that overwhelming introduction. I think it was actually longer than the speech I'm going to give, um, which is a good thing, right? Um, I want to thank again uh, Chairman Bayer and my esteemed colleagues for inviting me to speak today. It's both an honor and, all, as always, a great pleasure to have the chance to say some words to you. But I have to start, as always, like I start my classes, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a fabulous afternoon for graduation. And congratulations, graduates. You know, I must say that you guys really rock the captain gowns. I mean, I would never mistake you guys for like the crowd of great clips waiting for a haircut. Oh, no. Uh, and by the way, did you guys get those gowns from Lululemon by any chance? No? OK, I, just curious. Just ask it. Yeah, says the guy in the pink dress. Yeah. Well, I would like to add my word of welcome to all the family and friends who've come to celebrate this day with you. And of course, since it is Mother's Day, I want to give my own special shout out to all the moms here. Because you know, mom, every time one of your sons or daughter's cell phones went off in my class, I knew it was you <laughs> calling to give that extra bit of love and support to your child. I want to salute you for that. And you know, every time I said to your son or daughter, hey, give me the phone so I can talk to mom and thank her personally, they'd, they'd refuse. So now is my chance. I'm taking it. Thank you so much, mom. Yeah, come on. But you know, mom, if you could do me a little favor, could you take uh, your son or daughter aside and talk to them about their <clears throat> choice in ringtones on the phone side? We'd appreciate that. Anyway, all right. Well, I, uh, I really found it challenging to put a, uh, a speech together for today. And no, it's not because I have to avoid using the F word. I can, I'm pretty sure I can handle that for seven minutes. My students are laughing. They know what that's about. Uh, those of you who took my courses know that I put a lot of uh, effort into creating tests, as I like to say, that are worthy of you as Duke students. And I appreciate the fact that you always played along by acting like, oh, the tests are so hard, and oh, they're so long. It was so cute. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So similarly today, I tried hard to think about a message that was really worthy of you guys. Um, it, it's not that I'm short of things to say to you. Really, on the contrary, there are all kinds 
of excellent pieces of advice that I'd love to be able to give you. you know, for example, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got in college was from a friend of mine who said, never underestimate the insulating power of underwear. I know, it takes a little while, but it is solid gold. The problem I have in putting together a, a short speech with some advice I'd like to give you is that the advice I have really isn't compatible with where you're at in your lives right now. Because I know members of the class of 2013, I, I know exactly what you're thinking about. You're thinking about world domination. Yeah, it's okay, you guys have graduated. You can just drop the pretense. It's okay. I mean, think about it. You're 22 years old, you're invincible. You've just been awarded a, a degree from one of the best universities in town. You're about to launch yourself into a world that is clearly thirsting, thirsting for your unique vision and leadership, right? It's finally your turn, in other words, to get out there and make some changes to the world. You're thinking about what you're gonna accomplish in your careers, and I think that's really a good thing because if you're not thinking big at this point in your life, you're never gonna do it. But here's the thing. I don't think you're quite in the mood for the sort of advice I have to give you. Although the, the advice I have to give is fantastic, you just saw proof of that. It's not the kind of stuff that is going to help you achieve your plans for world domination. But nonetheless, I'm still gonna give it. I want you to file it away for later. You know, once you achieve domination, when you're, I don't know, 30, 35, you'll need something new to do, you know, uh, find enlightenment, take up home brewing, I don't know, something like that. So in that spirit, let me share one piece of advice. One of the most striking things that I think economics tells us is that when markets really work well, we put just enough resources into making something. And the key phrase here is just enough. It's not too much, it's not too little. And when we think about the overall economic system, you can see how great a virtue that is. Because if we make just enough, or we use just enough resources to make the things like the cars and the cell phones that we want, then we'll have enough resources to make other stuff too. So attaining this kind of sweet spot of using just enough resources is a model, if you will, that I want to apply to one other area of our lives. And here it is. Ladies and gentlemen, I am convinced that one of the big tricks in life is learning how to take things just seriously enough. We have a limited amount of energy to put into taking different things in our lives seriously, and it's really important to use that energy well. There are big demands on us to take all kinds of different things seriously. And frankly, many of those demands we place on ourselves so we can think about a market for taking things seriously. It's an internal market, and oddly, we are both the supplier and the demander in this market. And that's a problem because it means that there is no invisible hand in this market to set prices and quantities and generally smack you upside the head when you're doing a bad job of allocating those resources. Right? There's, no, there's no Carl Icahn in there to play, to play uh, opposite your Michael Dell. Do you guys get that? Carl Icahn, Michael Dell? Okay, read the paper. You, you need to start doing that. I keep saying that, but okay. Anyway, did you guys get that? The Carl Icahn to your Michael Dell thing? Okay, thank you. Okay, I was just, just a reality check. Thank you, thank you. Okay. So if anything, we, we face the danger that we end up taking things far more seriously than we need to, especially ourselves. And of course, that danger seems to be highest when you're young. You know, frankly, I wish I had some special kind of towel that I could offer to you when you come into my office, you know, dripping in seriousness. I just don't want to get any of it on me, right? You come into my office, oh, professor, I need to take a corporate finance class or I'm going to die. <laughs> that kind of seriousness. Now, when I think about the mistakes that I've made in my life, the big ones as well as the small ones, I'm, I look back and I think I've been more likely to make mistakes when I take myself or my work or my goals too seriously. When you take something too seriously, the outcomes just become too precious, they become almost sacred. There's no room for mistakes, which means there's less tolerance and less forgiveness in your life. 
and we take actions that are out of proportion to the goals. And we, we, we respond to mistakes in a really harsh and punitive way. So when you take something too seriously, as we probably found out, you can't relax. Your creativity goes out the window, and you can't think as clearly. And most importantly, taking things too seriously really just takes the joy and the fun out of whatever you're doing. So note, I'm not saying that you shouldn't take things seriously or not take them seriously enough. You need to take things just seriously enough. It's something you're going to have to work and practice at. You know, for example, whenever I get an email from one of the roughly uh, 10,000 deans here at Duke, you know, my first response is always, you've got to be kidding me. And then I carefully ignore the email just to make sure, you know, I'm getting that right balance. You know. So when you can find the right balance, take things just seriously enough, you'll actually have a better chance of going to where you want to go. You'll find the energy and the creativity to keep going forward, pay the dues that you got to pay to get to do the things that you want to do. And you may discover a detour along the road to world domination that actually takes you somewhere more rewarding and fun. Now, speaking of rewarding and fun, I'm going to wrap up. I want to thank the many of you who have been in my classes during the past four years. I hope you noticed that we really did try to take things just seriously enough. Helping you guys acquire the skills to be successful and really to join the rest of us here in the fight against ignorance and stupidity, that's really important to me. But it's too important to take too seriously. So thanks for your jokes the funny looks that you have just for me, and um, those drawings that you do on the backs of your tests, right? Um, I appreciate those very much. And thanks also for sharing a little of your class outside, uh, your time outside of class too, you know, to get nachos at the Dillo, may it rest in peace, uh, sit in my office and shoot the breeze. You know, sometimes we even uh, got answers for the problem sets. You know, that happened once in a while too. But I am sincerely grateful for having gotten to know many of you I hope to keep hearing from you as you go on to do all the crazy, wild, cool things that you never think about doing sitting here in Cameron on your graduation day. So class of 2013 and all graduates, I wish you both success and happiness. I know that you'll continue to make us very proud of you. Thanks very much. Peace. At this point, I, it is also my pleasure to call to the stage our Director of Graduate Studies, Professor Curtis Taylor. You are about a foot in front of the mic right there. Beautiful. Thanks, Thanks Charlie. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I missed this event last year. I was in, uh, at my daughter's graduation in Boulder, Colorado where it was 43 and raining, so I'm happy to be here this year. <laughs> um, I'm a long-distance runner, as most of my students know, and perhaps it's uh, not surprising in that regard that I think of earning the PhD as something of a, of a marathon in its own right. It requires determination, focus, sacrifice, and a little bit of luck. And like a marathon, earning a PhD degree doesn't always go exactly as planned. There's unexpected bumps in the road and turns along the way. And uh, it sometimes takes a little longer than you thought it might. That's what it's like from the student's side. I don't know that, uh, that the students really appreciate what it's like from the, uh, from the side of the faculty. We've known these students in our PhD program for four, five, six, sometimes even seven years. We've worked, worked closely with them. We've seen them grow and develop into economists. They came into the race as our pupils, and they're finishing the race as our peers. They came in as our students, and they're finishing as our colleagues. They came in as strangers, and they're finishing as our friends. Last night at the hooding ceremony, I was with my, one of my, sitting with one of my colleagues, and he said to me, I'm so proud of my student, he said, now I have to start worrying about whether he's going to get tenure. <laughs> we really, the, the relationship 
between the PhD student and the PhD advisor is something special. I, uh, I still see my own advisor some 22 years later and he's still giving me all kinds of uh, advice. Sometimes advice I didn't even ask for. Anyway, what I'd like to say before I hand out the diplomas to our PhD students is congratulations on finishing the race and welcome to the club. Thank you. So I'd like to welcome our PhD recipients to the stage. I guess off. Oh, I see it. Sorry, you're on this way. Emily Anderson. Honus Arias. Michael Dalton. Peter Landry. Kai Lee. Sophia Lee. Alvaro Name Correa. Marcelo Ochoa Coloma. Mehmet Azoy. Evan Pete. Kalina Staub. And Sergio Ungreu. And now I'd like to introduce and, and call to the stage our director of, master, of our master's program, Charlie Becker. Thanks, Pat. Congratulations to the PhD students. And it's my pleasure to introduce the master's program and its students. In following Connell's advice to take yourselves seriously but not too seriously, the master's program at Duke is unusual in that it is exceptionally demanding. We've branded ourselves for a long time as being the most difficult and quantitative master's program in North America and perhaps the world. At the same time, I look and think, how are, what's the difference between the undergraduate population and the PhD students? I think the master's students have done an excellent job of that. They take PhD courses, but they also camp out. Not, not, not when they don't, they don't own up to it in front of me, but I find out about this sort of thing. They write theses, they go on to exceptional jobs or on to, to doctoral programs, but they also, actually I think the PhD students also party a lot. I've, I, I accidentally get some of their correspondence, but they seem to have hit that, that, that mix very nicely. But mostly, I'm, I'm, my colleagues and I are enormously impressed with their endeavors, where they've come from, where they're going to, and it's, an, it's not as fun as the undergraduate world. It's ever so slightly less stressful than going on for a PhD, but they deserve great congratulations. I'd like to ask my colleague Martin Zelder, the associate director, to come and in read the names and for the master's students to line up. And, oh, but of course, I'm out of line. 
I, I, keep, I forget the, the routine here. There, so, there are many, many people who are highly worthy, but we'd like to invite two to receive particular awards for representing the essence of exceptional scholarship and, and achievement both in classroom and without. Tevi Chawa and Charles McClure. As they wander up here, the longer they take, the more I'll tell you about them. Tevi comes to us from Indonesia's Central Bank, Bank Indonesia. She was, wins this award even though she rejected me when I asked her to be my teaching assistant. She chose Professor Tower instead. Um, I think that's enough to embarrass Tevi. Charlie McClure is, he didn't reject my offers. I never made it to him because he was always in the over in the business school and is heading to the PhD program in business at Stanford. So, Tevi, congratulations. If they remain on stage, we'll ask them to sing their national songs, but, oh, but they're, they're going. At this point, I'd like to ask Martin Zelder to come up. Uh, MA graduates, please come forward to receive your degrees. Justina Adamanti. Justina Adamanti. Quan Liu. Futan. Laura Paul. Pascal Anders. Krishanu Ray. Andreas Moller. Ala Kalitova. Elius Fermann. Andrew T.O. Hayes. Igor Hernandez. Uditya Romanto. Mengchen Ling. Jose David Sierra Castillo. Ibrahim Kaita, <laughs> Naoya Kato, <laughs> Kumi Molioka, <laughs> Mustafa Ulut. <laughs> Kubeb. Siddiqui, <laughs> Young Che Yu, <laughs> B1 Elise Zhang, <laughs> Ye Zhang, <laughs> Tevi Hawa. Charles Gavon McClure. 
Mauricio Cañas. Hui Hao Yan. Shi Shu Bei. Shu Che. Jin Zhao. Gracie Ma. Yu Ching Hu. Yan Huang. Tren Her Wang. Yan Huang. Tren Her Wang. Congratulations, MA graduates. It's my pleasure now to call to the stage Professor Frank Sloan, who will introduce our student speaker. It's an honor to uh, introduce uh, Omar Nazal, who will be uh, our student speaker. Uh, student speakers are chosen uh, on the basis of general academic record and also for an outstanding job on their uh, uh, honors theses. Um, Omar uh, hails from uh, uh, Toledo, Ohio, um, and uh, came here uh, intending to be a pre-med uh, student, and I guess started that and finished a major in biology uh, as well as in uh, economics. Um, uh, he, uh, uh, at least his current plan, or he, what he's doing, is going to work uh, in consulting um, at Bain and Company. Uh, he wrote a very interesting thesis, and it was on the topic, it seems an arcane topic, of cost shifting, hospital cost shifting. And the idea uh, which uh, the hospitals uh, tell us uh, is that Medicare, if Medicare tries to cut what it pays the hospital, the hospital will merely raise its prices uh, to other uh, payers. And so it, this is counterproductive. And economists tend to poo-poo this and say, well, that's just, uh, you know, why don't they charge the prices they would anyway, and why would they do that? Uh, uh, but Omar looks at this empirically and finds uh, some very interesting evidence of some persistence of this uh, cost shifting. Uh, so uh, I don't think he's going to talk about this, but uh, <laughs> uh, it is one reason that he's here. Omar. So thank you, Professor Sloan, for that, uh, that wonderful introduction. Um, before jumping into my speech, um, I just want to acknowledge in front of all of these people the, the hours of mentorship and the guidance that you've invested in me over the last few months. And uh, I'm not going to lie, Professor Sloan, I may have been a bit in over my head when I asked you to be my thesis advisor. And, uh, it was kind of this running joke in my thesis seminar that um, you know I'd spend two weeks of staying up till four or five in the morning running these regressions or putting presentations together, and I'd walk in your office and I'd present my results, and inevitably I would leave with twice as much work to do, regardless of how good these results were. And uh, and we had a verb for it in my thesis seminar. We called it getting sloaned. So, so. So Professor Sloan, in front of all these people, I just want to thank you publicly for sloaning me and sloaning my thesis, sloaning Wednesday night shooters, sloaning my senior spring over and over again. <laughs> but seriously, without you, my thesis would not have been half of what it turned out to be, and I was so lucky to be able to work alongside you on the capstone of my undergraduate education. So thank you again for everything. So let me backtrack and get a, a bit more traditional introduction. Um, 
friends, families, and faculty. It's a, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Uh, class of 2013, congratulations again on making it here. Let's go. <laughs> So, uh, so I got this email from Professor Follenkamp about a week ago um, telling me to prepare you know, a five-minute speech or so for, for today's ceremonies. And, uh, and at the time, I was coming off, the tail, end, coming off the, the tail end of writing my thesis, and I had a pile of lecture notes that uh, I had to get through before final exams, stuff that I'd put on the back burner while I was, while I was actually writing my thesis. Um, so I decided to put everything off until after I, I took my finals. And then Beach Week happened, and then my parents came in and relatives came in, and I found myself staring at a blank Word document yesterday afternoon that I had titled a graduation speech, but nevertheless blank. Um, so I skipped the president's reception and I skipped the forever Duke party, uh, made it to shooters, but you know, skipped everything else in between. And, uh, and I did what I thought was the most useful exercise at that point. So I, I kind of sat down with my MacBook Pro and you know, hooked up a second monitor and got a cup of coffee and Googled best economics graduation speeches. <laughs> and, uh, and I spent an hour or so you know, watching YouTube videos and, and ended up stumbling upon um, you know, ceremonies from around the country, from Harvard and Penn and, and even here at Duke. And uh, in this Word document, I kind of jot jotted down the main themes that tied all of these speeches together. And, and I wanted to get an idea of you know, what would be an appropriate subject and tone and, and length. And, uh, and I finished this initial research stage and, and I reviewed my notes and I found that all of these speeches were surprisingly similar. So they usually start off with an anecdote about a notoriously difficult professor, check. And then um, there's some inside joke about attendance at an 8.30 class, which I haven't made yet, but um, here it is, 8.30 econometrics, right? <laughs> and, then, and then two to three minutes expounding upon the virtues of the skills accrued from a rigorous curriculum in economic theory. That must have been one of the sentences I wrote after shooters. And, and then kind of a very dramatic and grandiose conclusion that went something like, as you go forth from here, um, stay true to yourself and always remember that you majored in economics at blank university. But the most interesting parts of those speeches were those couple of minutes that touched on the value of an economics degree. And as I listened to last year's speech and I tried to figure out how much I could copy without Professor Fallenkamp noticing, I'm, I made a quick list of those traits that came up as associated with the undergraduate degree in economics. And I noticed that these traits converged onto a handful of big ideas. And so I took that list of ideas or themes and I summed them up into two main points. That as economics students, we are taught to value rational reasoning based on just justifiable assumptions, and we value certainty in our predictive abilities. And that philosophy manifests itself throughout our core curriculum, where we were taught to solve for equilibrium prices and to optimize utility functions and to evaluate trade-offs at the margin. And in almost every question of every core exam that we've taken, we were asked to find a solution that we could say with certainty is a answer. And given enough assumptions and given the parameters of the problem, we could say with certainty is the answer. And, uh, but here I'm going to deviate from the traditional framework of the econ graduation speech for a bit. Is it possible that we incurred a hidden cost as we spent the last four years learning to think economically? And I ask that question partly to be provocative, um, but also partly as because the students of economics were taught to think in terms of opposing effects, like the wealth effect and the substitution effect and you know, the concept behind the Laffer curve. And our coursework has taught us to draw conclusions from models based on assumptions of rationality and to develop a deep respect for that certainty but are we not about to enter a world that proves to us again and again and again that it is anything but certain and rational? And if so, are the lessons that we learned over the last four years irrelevant for the next 60 years of our lives? And it's something that we've all thought about throughout our intro classes, that many of the assumptions that we make to simplify our models and our calculations, um, you know, they often don't hold in reality. So what does that mean about what we've done with the last four years? And class 2013, in short, my answer to that is no. And defending the logic train that we take in economics, that systematic approach to how we solve problems, that's it's an entirely different thesis in epistemology and philosophy. So as a true student of economics, I'm going to take a shortcut here. Um, let's assume that those critiques of economics are true. Class of 2013, even if they were, we are different. 
Think about your last four years. We entered Duke at the tail end of a devastating recession. And then, at the same time that we were soaking up the fundamentals of economic theory, the formative years of our economic thought, we were reading about bailouts and credit crunches and manufacturing slowdowns. In essence, we learned to appreciate that reductive power of the assumption from the classroom, but we also witnessed what happens when those assumptions of rationality cease to hold. So while our training in economics at Duke has instilled in us that craving for certainty, that reliance on breaking down incredibly complex events and decisions into models that we can understand and use to predict, we are unique in the sense that the economic events of the last four years have also endowed, with us, endowed us with an almost religious reverence of the uncertain and the immeasurable. So that when we get blindsided by something unexpected, and you know, not just forget policy and financial markets, even in our personal and our professional lives, when things happen to us that given our inputs and our framework should not have happened, we shake it off quickly. The combination of expectation of the unexpected the comfort with ambiguity and with randomness that we have learned as observers of the world over the last four years, as well as the analytical rigor that we have learned as students of economics here at Duke, that's what's going to make us better economic thinkers and bankers and lawyers and doctors and consultants, but mostly bankers and consultants. <laughs> so I leave you with one of my favorite quotes from Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. Um, and I think one, of, one relevant in, in, this, uh, in this topic of uncertainty, but also in the uncertainty of our immediate future as we sit here in the, in the final few minutes of our undergraduate education. Contradictions do not exist. Whenever you think that you are facing a contradiction, check your premises. You will find that one of them is wrong. Class of 2013, congratulations. Go forth from here, stay true to yourselves, and always remember that you majored in economics at Duke University. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Kevin Thomas Hogan. He Young Lim. Jonathan Cantor Marks. Sabrina McCutcheon. John Mills Reed. Sammy Safon. Robert Van Dusen. Andrew, oh, Kevin Wong. <laughs> Trent Chung. Trent Chung. Rajalakshmi Day. Yohan Christian Hornell. Linda Lee. David Martarana. William Alfred Nance the Third Christopher Paul Picalella Jackson Ray Pfeiffer David Meste Short. James Sun. Allison Vernere. Thomas Michael Atwood. Christopher Robin Robinson Brown. Mitchell Drake Gorecki. Raul K. Nayak. Omar Nazam. And now, um, those of, within this group, we'd like to recognize some special awards that are uh, given by the uh, Johnson Fund every year. So those of you who are winning awards. If you could come back up, you'll get more prizes. Um, so for outstanding honors poster session by the student vote is Raul Nayak. Outstanding honors poster session student vote tie, sorry, Omar. Don't worry, he, he'll get lots of prizes, so. <laughs> uh, 
Outstanding Honors Poster Faculty Vote, Mitchell Gorecki. Best Symposium Presentation, second place, Raul Nayak. Best Symposium Presentation, first place, Omar Nizal. <laughs> Best Thesis Finalist, so we had some very good um, theses this year, and the Honors Committee, when readers are reviewing, they suggest which theses they think might be the best. We have several finalists, and then the overall Best Thesis Prize. So, Best Thesis Finalist, Thomas Atwood. And his co-author, Best Thesis Finalist, Christopher Brown. Best Thesis Finalist, Raul Naya. Best Thesis Finalist, Omar Nazal. And finally, the thesis that was uh, considered the best thesis uh, this year is award to Mitchell Gorecki. I want to recognize, again, all the honors students for doing amazing work this year. Thank you. At this point, we'd like the uh, students to come forward for uh, graduation to receive your diplomas. Aiko Kokosova. Samir Rao. Bao Tran Fu. Not a chance. Miguel Clement. Joseph A. LaBarbara. Jacob Lewis Levitt. Alex Graff. Wilson Buchanan. Randy Stephen Rawning, Jr. Nikita Komedy. <laughs> Sylvia Sechelanu. <laughs> Courtney Ellenbogen. <laughs> Jessica Yu Chan. Liz Melissa Moreno. Stephen Pedersen Sloka.
Hirsch Lagdawala. Alexandra Brearley. Donna Budman. Katerina Valcheva. Z Zhao. Zizi Petkova. Jasmine Boatner. Jacqueline Shu. Ji Yao. Luke Joseph Cohane. Christian Alstrop. Jean Marc Gogikian. Yang Zhang. Yason Wang. Andrea Daniela Mihic. Tom Dodon. Samuel Altman Weil. Bradley Ezrati. Edgar Clayton Scooter Boggs III. Cherry Jessica Tran. Harold Douglas Wackerly. Jonathan Temple. Andrew Thomas Margis. <laughs> Connie Chang. Christina Lombana. Gregory William Eco. Jesus Tueme. Sean Bohan. Edward James McCarthy. Joshua Brooks Kelly. Stephen Lambert. Andrea Korob. <laughs> Tiffany Ahmed. <laughs> Laura Elizabeth Burns. <laughs> Madeline Lehman. <laughs> Madeline Payne. Matthew Benjamin Circle. Julie Ann Fox. Michael David Tringali. Benjamin Daniel Snyder. Connor Patrick McDade. Paul Axelrod. 
Paul Vanderslice Jr. Tim Shu. John Chen. Christopher Dahl Buzak. Tara Kolipara. Amit Parak. Hannah Schechter. Rory Makima. Kavin Vasudevan. Andrew David Norwood. Boying Shui. Paul William Horak. Ryan Sorabji. Rukaiya Diwan. Ellen Margaret Mishler. Michael Frank Gay. Brooke Alessandra Higgs. Chloe Elizabeth Wolf. George Caratanuto. Christopher Michael Cirillo. Evan Prizent. Elena Botea. Michelle Hassan. Alexander Skabadonis. Christopher Ward. Laura Chow. Kimberly Claire Schwartz. Katarzyna Trushkovska. Sing Su. Joanne Ja. Yi Chi Chang. Yuan Ingrid Zhuang. Guan Huang. Tim Wong. Hanyang Cao. Shu Niu. Leon Ho. Dian Lu. Hanyang Wang. Leonard Ingino. Um Dasani. <clears throat> Gargi Bansal. <coughs> Christine Liao. Roberto Dacchia. Jason Kwok. 
Ian Harrison Rappaport. <laughs> Natasha Fritz. Mike Q. Tara Lee. Taehun Kim. Carmen Marie Augustin. Adam Vajdani. Scott Spencer. Adam Scott Talpilar. Ethan Minson King. Abraham Lee. Lucas Mitchell. Michael Robert Neary. Matthew Robert Cambick. <clears throat> Andrew Trigby Ellingson. Ina Lee. Yang Yang Xiao. Daniel Chilian Zan. Jean Zhu. Ryan Brown. Joseph Pack. Nicholas Bullard Hurst. Megan Elizabeth Fellows. Henry Brooks Meyer. Yang Pan. Michael Nee. Is that it? As we close the ceremony today, I want to ask your favor uh, for two things. One, for the honor students, if you can collect your posters afterwards, that would be great. I'm sure you'll want those for your apartments as you uh, move on. And if the rest of us could uh, help by disposing our trash, there's another ceremony here for the engineering school after ours. That'd be great. Thank you. So as many of you know, this is one of the loudest basketball stadiums in the world, especially when Duke is playing UNC, but I, pretty much every time I've been here. And since we're the largest major here at Duke, we have the privilege of hosting our ceremony here in Cameron. And so I'd like to close the ceremony by having two last kind of Cameron-worthy cheers. First for our staff. As a large major, our staff is incredibly important in helping all of you and helping all of us uh, to, to have a great uh, time working and studying in, in our department, not just for this ceremony, but throughout the year. And finally, I want to have one last loud Cameron-worthy cheer for our graduating class, the class of 2013.
to a close. Thank you very much, everybody.